You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected works by Rudolf Steiner, into, uh, number 314, entitled Physiology and Healing, translated by Anna Moise. This is the last section. I'm going to call this Lecture 17, even though it's a discussion titled Discussion with Medical Practitioners, Fragmentary Notes, Part 2, given in Dornach on the 23rd of April, 1924. And this is the last section of the book. In connection with the question put by Dr. Husemann yesterday, we have decided to read out two case records from the book which, thanks to Dr. Wegman, is due to appear shortly. This may be followed by things you would wish to know in the spirit of your question. I would ask you, of course, to be very dis- discreet about these cases for the time being, as they will be integral parts of the book due to appear shortly. The cases are meant to show how you arrive at treatment specifically from the diagnosis. This is to be demonstrated, doing so on the basis of anthroposophy. We will not shy away from speaking in wholly anthroposophical terms in this book. In our reading this, Dr. Wegman read out Case 4 on page, page 95 of Extending Practical Medicine. Quote, a child who had been brought to the clinic twice, first at age four, then at age five and a half, also the child's mother and the mother's sister. Steiner again. It is important that the mother and sister were there. You'll see why in a minute. Continue with the reading. The process of diagnosis led from the child's illness to the mother's and also that of her sister. With the child, we found the following. It was a twin born six weeks prematurely. The other child had died in the final embryonic stage. At the age of six weeks, the child fell ill, crying a great deal, and was taken to hospital. Pylorospasm was diagnosed. The child was fed partly by a wet nurse, partly artificially. It was discharged from hospital at eight months. Arrived at home, it had a seizure the first day, and this recurred daily for the first two months. The child would stiffen in an attack, turning up its eyes. Attacks were preceded by timidity and crying. The child also had a squint in the right eye and would vomit before an attack. At age two and a half, another attack occurred, lasting five hours. The child went stiff again and lay there as if dead. At age four, it had an attack lasting 30 minutes. This was the first attack reported to be accompanied by pyrexia. The parents noted that the convulsions that happened after the child came back from hospital were followed by paralysis of the right arm and leg. The child made its first attempts at walking at age two and a half. It was only able to step out with the left leg, dragging the right leg after it. The right arm also remained without will impulses. The condition still persisted when the child was brought to see us. What we had to do was establish the situation with regard to the aspects of the child's organization. This was done independent of the syndrome. We found the ether body to be greatly atrophied, in some parts only accepting a very low level of astral body influence. Close quote. Steiner again. Those essentially were the findings. The ether body was atrophied in many different locations and did not accept the influence of the astral body in those places. You got such lacunae in the ether body, see plate 9. The astral body did not enter the sites where the ether body was atrophied. This was the case in a number of sites in the organism. Continue reading, quote, the region of the, right, of the right chest was as if paralyzed in the ether body. 
On the other hand, we noted something like a hypertrophy of the astral body in the stomach region. Close quote. Steiner again. One has to use unusual terminology. Just as the term hypertrophy is used for areas that are too active, too lively. Continue quote. Then the syndrome had to be considered in relation to this. The astral body was clearly putting a considerable strain on the stomach in the digestive process, which however was static at the transition from intestine to lymph vessels because of paralysis of the ether body. This resulted in malnutrition of the blood. The symptoms of nausea and retching thus had to be taken very seriously. Seizures always result if the etheric body grows atrophic and the astral body comes to have a direct influence on the physical body without mediation from the ether body. Close quote. Steiner again. This is important on principle. The seizures developed because astral body, ether body, and physical body were no longer in their regular relationship. The way you have to think of this is of the astral body only acting on the physical body with the help of the ether body. When there are such areas of atrophy, the astral body influences the physical body, leaving the ether body aside. Spasms will occur wherever this is the case. We know that in a site where spasms develop, the ether body is not mediating properly between astral body and physical body. Continue quote. This applied very much in the case of this child. If the condition becomes permanent during the growth period, which was the case here, processes that make the motor system ready to receive the will in the normal way do not occur. This took the form of the child not being able to use the right side. We then had to connect the child's condition with that of the mother. She was 37 years of age when she came to us. She stated that she had been as tall as she was now at age 13. Her teeth were bad at an early age. Close quote. Steiner again. Please take special note of this. She did not grow any further from her 13th year until now meaning that growth was complete by the time she reached sexual maturity. Continue quote. Her teeth were bad at an early age. She had rheumatic fever as a child and maintained that she had had rickets. Menashe was relatively early. The patient said she had had a kidney disease at age 16 and also referred to some kind of seizures she had had. At age 15, she had chronic constipation because of spasms in the anal sphincter, which had to be stretched. She still had spasms with every stool. Diagnosis of her condition, based on direct observation, with no conclusions drawn from her syndrome, showed remarkable similarity with that of the child, only everything was much milder in form. It had to be considered that the human ether body develops especially between the changing of the teeth and puberty. In the patient, this was evident from the fact that the available forces of the ether body, which were not very strong, made growth possible only until she reached puberty. This is the point where the special development of the astral body began, which, being hypertrophic, overwhelmed the ether body and intervened too strongly in the physical organization. Close quote. Steiner again. Both were of the same type. Mother and child showed excessive intervention of the astral body in the physical body. Continue quote. This came to expression in cessation of growth at age 13. The patient was anything but dwarf size, however, and in fact very tall, which was due to the fact that the ether body's growth forces uninhibited by the astral body, caused a tremendous increase in the volume of her physical body. These forces were not yet able, at the time, to intervene in the functions of the physical body in a regular way. This was evident in the development of rheumatic fever and, later on, of seizures. Close quote. Steiner again. The rheumatic fever as such was also connected with the fact that the astral body intervenes directly in the physical body at the joints, 
This also leads to inflammatory changes, where such are possible. So one has either seizures or inflammatory conditions. Continue, quote, Because of weakness of the ether body, the action of the astral body on the physical body was particularly powerful. This was a destructive effect. In a normally developing life, it is balanced out by constructive forces during sleep, when the astral body has separated from the physical and ether body. If the ether body is too weak, as in the case of our patient, excessive destruction occurs. And in her case, this could be seen from the fact that she needed her first filling in her teeth in her twelfth year. Close quote. Steiner again. There is too much destruction due to excessive intervention from the astral body. Physical body and ether body build up. Astral body and eye organization deteriorate. If there is excessive destructive activity, this is evident in a phenomenon such as having to have fillings at age 12. Her teeth got worse with every pregnancy. Continue quote. If the ether body has extra demands made on it, as in pregnancy, this will always cause dental deterioration. The weakness of the ether body, as far as its connection with the astral body was concerned, was also particularly evident in the frequency of dreams and in the fact that the patient slept soundly, despite all the irregularities. Close quote. Steiner again. If the relationship between astral body, ether body, and physical body is completely regular, there will be no excess of dreams. The moment the astral body is able to be overweening because the ether body has weakened, dreams will be frequent and lively. Also, the astral body being strong can easily go out and sleep nevertheless remains sound. Continue quote. The weakness of the ether body was also apparent from the fact that foreign processes not controlled by the ether body occurred in the physical body, presenting as proteins, occasional hyaline casts, and salts in her urine. Close quote. Steiner again. These products of degradation develop due to astral body hypertrophy. One must always look for them when it is a case of astral body hypertrophy. Continue quote. It is interesting to note the way these pathological processes relate to those of the mother's sister. The diagnosis concerning the composition of the aspects of the human being is almost entirely the same. Weak ether body activity, therefore dominance of the astral body. Only in her case the astral body itself is weaker than her sister's. Menarche was therefore early too, but instead of inflammation, she merely had pain due to irritation of the organs, that is, the joints. Close quote. Steiner again. That is really most interesting. You have almost the same morbid constitution in mother and child. The sister, parallel to this, only gets as far as milder symptoms. Everything is to a lesser degree with her, in miniature we might say, in hints. Continue quote. The ether body has to be especially active in the joints if vitality is to go normally. If ether body activity is weak, the activity of the physical body becomes dominant, which showed in swellings and chronic arthritis in this case. The weakness of the astral body, which is not acting sufficiently on subjective feelings, is evident from a preference for sweet foods which increase sensation for the astral body. Close quote. Steiner again. That is most interesting. If you want to cope with these things, you do actually have to ask what the individual concerned likes to eat. Sweet or bitter things. Preference for sensory impressions of one kind or another. Some have a peculiar weakness when it comes to smells. It all shows that the astral body must get involved in some way. This preference, shown by the astral body, indicates that it is not involved. It gets involved as soon as it is given sweets. Continue quote. 
If in addition daily life had worn out a weak astral body, has worn out a weak astral body, the pain will be more significant if the weakness persists. The patient complained of pain getting worse in the evenings. The connection between the disease states of the three patients pointed to the generation ascendant to the two sisters and especially the child's grandmother. The cause must lie with her. The upset balance between astral and ether body in all three patients can only have arisen from an equal imbalance in the child's grandmother. This irregularity must go back to the grandmother's astral and ether body not achieving adequate nutrition of the fetal membranes which feed the embryo, especially the allantois. Close quote, Steiner again. This case is particularly interesting because one discovers that the cause truly lies in inadequate development of the grandmother's allantois. The whole condition of the astral body, which of course presents vehemently in one of them, the mother, and less in the other, takes us back to the grandmother. It is not bound up with one part, but goes constitutionally through the whole astral body and can only go back to that particular, to that peculiar development, to the allantois, to the embryonic period. This is an occult finding that must be taken in. But once one has found it, the individual phenomena are perfectly in line for verification. You must definitely get in the habit of verifying causes from causes. The composition of symptoms really only gives one an unclear picture. Continue, quote, The inadequate development of the Alantuis has to be looked for in all three patients. The physical Alantuis is metamorphosed, becoming non-physical, into the capability of the astral body's forces. Close quote. Readers aside, I'm pronouncing the word A-L-L-A-N-T-O-I-S as Alantuis. End of readers aside, Steiner continues. This comes in as well. We were only able to suggest it as a principle in the physical Alantuis, which also can only be embryonic. All the organs which are abandoned in the embryo exist as the higher aspects of the human being once born. Physical as an accessory organ, it is spiritual in the adult state, so that we only have to see the physical correlate of the embryonic period in the Alantuis. Continue, quote, A degenerated Alantuis results in reduced capability of the astral body, which shows itself especially in all motor organs. All this held true for all three patients. It is indeed possible to perceive the quality of the Alantuis by considering that of the astral body. Close quote, Steiner again. The point is that we have to know the amnion is the physical correlate of the adult person's ether body, the Alantuis, that of the astral body, the chorion of the eye organization. Continue quote. It will be evident from this that our reference to the ascendance does not derive from hazardous conclusions based on fantasy, but from genuine observations using the methods developed in the science of the spirit. To anyone who feels irritated by this truth, we would say that the above has nothing to do with a love for going against accepted views, but a desire not to withhold insights, which after all have been gained from anyone. The mystical concepts of heredity will remain forever obscure if we shy away from accepting the idea of metamorphosis from physical to non-physical and the reverse in successive generations. As regards treatment, an insight like the above must inevitably give us an idea as to where the healing process should be initiated. Close quote. Steiner again. We now come to the treatment aspect. Continue, quote, If we had not been pointed in the direction of the hereditary aspect, but had merely noted the irregularity in the relationship between ether body and astral body, 
we would have used medicines that act on these two aspects of the human being. In the present case, this would have proved ineffective, however, for the damage going through generations lies too deep to be balanced out in these aspects of the human organizations themselves. Close quote, Steiner again. It is particularly important that we consider this case. We have a situation which relates to the question asked yesterday. If the findings were merely that astral body and ether body are not in close accord, and therefore one must take this or that medicine, we would be unlikely to get any kind of result. If we strictly go on to the cause, treatment too will be more definite. The focus of attention moved from direct observation and we considered the sequence of generations and this pointed the way to strict exactitude. Continue quote. In a case like this, we have have to influence the I organization, bringing everything into play that has to do with harmonizing and strengthening the ether and astral body. We achieve this by addressing the I organization in enhanced sensory stimuli, as it were, parenthesis, sensory stimuli act on the eye organization, close parenthesis. We attempted to do so in the following way for the child. A 5% pyrites ointment dressing was applied to the right hand and at the same time golden agaric ointment, parenthesis, amanita, Caesarea, close parenthesis, was massaged into the left half of the head. Close quote, Steiner again. So, here you have the treatment. We have a direct action on the hand with pyrites, F-E-S. This gives us in a, excuse me, this puts us in a position where it stimulates the eye organization to make the astral body more lively and at the same time influence the ether body and so bring about harmonization. We must endeavor to bring ether body and astral body more closely together. The cure depends on this. It means we must use agents that go beyond the immediate, for it was a matter of generations. Continue quote. Externally applied pyrites and iron sulfide stimulates the eye organization to make the astral body more lively and increase its affinity to the ether body. The action of golden agaric substance with organized nitrogen, a special constituent, is to let an action going via the eye organization evolve from the head, which makes the ether body more lively and increases its affinity to the astral body. The healing process was supported by eurythmy therapy, which makes the eye organization as such lively and active. This results in externally applied principles being taken to the depths of the organization. The healing process thus initiated was further enhanced by measures designed to make astral and ether body particularly sensitive to the influence of the eye organization. Using a rhythmic diurnal sequence, baths were given with the decoction of solidago, back rubs with a decoction of Stellaria media, and both a tea made of willow bark, acts specifically on the astral body's receptivity, and stanum, point zero zero one, specifically makes the ether body receptive by mouth. We also gave poppy juice in weak doses to induce the individual's damaged inherent organization to make room for the medicinal actions. The mother had more of the last of the above treatments, since she was one generation earlier, so that hereditary forces were less involved. The same applied to the mother's sister. We were able to note that whilst still in the clinic, the child was more biddable and the general psychological condition had improved. It was more obedient, for instance, and movements that had been very clumsy were done in a more skillful way. Later, the aunt reported that the child had gone through a big change. It had grown quieter. The excess of involuntary movements was reduced. It has gained sufficient skills to be able to play on its own. And with reference to the psychology, the former obstinacy had disappeared. 
Close quote. Steiner again. Now, perhaps you'd like to say something. This is the way of taking diagnosis forward to treatment. It then comes about that we get the higher aspects of the human being, the higher levels of human existence, to help us. We have the syndrome as our starting point. In this case, it is that the sick organism was subject to a process that took a particular course. We have to follow it back to its beginning. If we have a clear view of the evolution, we are able to trace it back, seeing how not just an organ, but the whole inner human being is connected with the things that happen out in the world. Let us say you want to learn how some kind of lesion, perhaps in the gallbladder, may be treated. For this you must study it in its opposite process out there, at least getting this opposite process to aid you. If you perceive one process to be going one way, let us say, you perceive the other to be coming the other way, which gives you the complete cycle. Would someone still have a question, perhaps? And there's a question. One can sometimes get to the diagnosis in adults, sometimes in people who are alive in their souls, I have tried this also with children, but gained the impression that I went too far there with this method of diagnosis. Steiner again. That you did not achieve what you intended by entering into the psyche? This is something that may be true and may also be incorrect. It entirely depends on how far one is able to worm the things one wants to know out of the child, also on whether the child is chatty or not, and on the memory function also on whether one is getting the right things from the soul. In principle, a child can truly provide magnificent things, especially when there are condensed soul phenomena. When you take account of child nature, and the child speaks of things seen in terms of condensed soul phenomena, you can look deeply into irregularities. These are always the correlate. You have to consider the case in a completely individual way. With adults, it is, of course, fairly easy to enter into the mind and soul if you know the soul organism as such, if you know how people are apt to tell one any old thing. You then move on. The things they tell are mostly untrue. It starts with the patient not saying how it is. You then have to pick it up at some point. You get to something which is the most true. Having grasped this, you can move on. You have to make out if the one goes with the other. A creature with an eagle's beak cannot at the same time have an ostrich's feet. In the soul, too, things go together, or not. You have to guide the patient toward this. Until you pick it up at some point, you believe everything. That is, you don't believe anything, but you make it clear to him that you believe everything he says. Once you have picked it up at a point where it has to be true, you make very clear to him what cannot be. This creates a kind of soul organism for you which strongly points to the bodily organism. And so it is indeed useful to base yourself on a diagnostic process at the level of mind and soul. There's a comment. A member of the audience said something. Rudolf Steiner again. The direction in which you pointed yesterday is like this. I make a diagnosis have the diagnosis before me. I know that when I have this, such and such medicines are available to me. I am able to choose among them. You want to know how one can actually make a choice. The answer can only be that one says, if I am able to choose between a number of medicines, I have to assume that my diagnosis is not yet complete. I must go further in making the diagnosis until I arrive at one definite medicine. In principle, there is no arbitrary choice. This was really a fortunate case, and it amazed me. Going from the condition of the child to the grandmother's allantois is something which does not generally come up in making a diagnosis. It did greatly amaze me that this was the motif. On the other hand, the results show that one must aim to penetrate to the very last cause. Dr. Wegman then read out case 5 in the book, quote, A woman aged 26 came to the clinic, suffering from serious consequences 
of an attack of influenza in 1918 in conjunction with pulmonary catarrh that had followed a pleurisy she had had in 1917. The patient had never been really well since she had the influenza. In 1920, she was greatly emaciated, weak, with a slight temperature and night sweats. Soon after the attack of influenza, she developed low back pain, which got worse until late in 1920. Then the pain was extremely severe, and a curvature was noted in the sacral region. Her right index finger became swollen. Bed rest was stated to improve the back pain. When the patient came to us, she had a gravitation abscess in the right thigh, bloated abdomen with slight ascites. Uh, readers aside, I'm, I'm pronouncing that it's A S C I T E S. Forgive me, I'm pronouncing that ascites. And readers aside and catarrhal sounds over the apices of both the left and the right lung. Digestion and appetite were good. The urine was concentrated with traces of protein. Investigation using the science of the spirit showed hypersensitivity of the astral body and the eye organization. This kind of abnormality initially comes to expression in the ether body in that it does not develop proper ether functions. But an etheric off-print of the astral functions. Close quote. Steiner again. It is most interesting when, in such a case as this, the ether body is so weak that it does not perform its own functions, but is like a matrix, like wax, with the astral body imprinting its own functions on it. We have here an ether body fun- functioning like a disguised astral body. That is the situation here. Continue quote. Astral functions are destructive. Vitality and the normal process in the physical organs therefore had to show atrophy. This is always connected with processes that are normally outside the human being, as it were, taking place within the human organism. Close quote. Steiner again. This we must firmly hold on to. When something enters into the human organism, be it from some state of aggregation or other, or be it warm air, and so on, it must go through a change within the human organism, or, roughly speaking, within the human skin. Nothing is the same outside of and within the human organism. The human organization has to transform everything coming into it from outside. No temperature process may run in the human organism the way it does in a stone, where a temperature simply passes through, warming the whole stone. When warmth comes to us from outside, the way it does to an inorganic body, we transform the warmth which comes to us in this way so profoundly that it is wholly filled with life. If a chill develops, even if it is a chill in the internal organs, it does not come from inside but from a temperature condition imposed from outside. This extends down to the conditions existing in metabolism. Any substance that comes in must be transformed right down to its most subtle processes in the human organism. Anything we take in, let's say a carbohydrate, must go through a further process in the organism. The carbon, hydrogen, oxygen process in the world outside the human being must not exist in there in the same way. In that case, a process foreign to human nature would exist in a human being. All pathological conditions based on metabolic deposits are essentially due to this. Basically, they are due to warmth processes not coming from the human being, but arising as processes inherent in the foreign matter, because the human organization is not strong enough in some area. If the eye organization is too weak, for example, you'll find that ingested fats are not properly processed. If the astral organization is too weak, you'll find that carbohydrates are not properly processed. If the ether organization is too weak, you'll find that the ingested proteinic states are not properly processed. This is something you must take note of. Continue quote. The gravitation abscess, the back pain, the bloated abdomen, 
the catarrhal symptoms in the lung and inadequate processing of protein were due to this. Treatment had to consist in reducing the sensitivity of the astral body and the eye organization. This is done by giving silica, which always increases the inherent powers to counter sensitivity. Close quote. Steiner again. Silica always strengthens the inherent powers to counter sensitivity. Continue quote. In this case we added powdered silica to the food and gave it in animas. We also derived the sensitivity by putting mustard plasters on the lower back. The action of this is to generate sensitivity on its own accord, which relieves the astral body and eye organization of sensitivity. Close quote. Steiner again. You see how one can help oneself. You apply mustard plasters and this produces an artificial sensitivity which relieves the astral body of its inner sensitivity, creating a stimulus in this way. Footnote. Following consultation with Dr. Hans Broder von Laue, I have put, quote, creating a stimulus, close quote, or one might think of, quote, giving a hint, close quote, if the word appearing in the transcript was heard correctly. Rudolf Steiner said intimation, using the term three times, translator, and a footnote. It is often the case, when something is not right in the human levels of existence, that one creates a stimulus, in this case a powerful downward stimulus of the astral body. If this grows sufficiently powerful, the sensitivity will have gone. The sensitivity of the astral body decreases in a downward direction. Sensitivity is increased when it moves upward. Continue quote. A process to reduce astral body sensitivity in the digestive tract was used to channel this astral activity to the ether body, which is where it normally should be. This was achieved with copper and carboanimalis in low doses. The possibility of the ether body refusing to take up normal digestive activity, having got out of the habit, was countered by giving pancreatic juice. Close quote. Steiner again. That is merely an aid, a final aid. Continuing quote. The gravitation abscess was aspirated a number of times, removing large quantities of pus. The abscess was reduced and the abdominal swelling decreased, with pus formation decreasing steadily and finally ceasing. When pus was still being discharged, a further elevation of temperature took us by surprise one day. It did not seem inexplicable, the constitution of the astral body being, as described, even minor upsets could cause such a fever. Distinction must be made, however, between the explicable nature of such a fever and the severe damage it can cause. Under the given conditions, such a fever actually mediates profound intervention of destructive processes in the organism. Care must be taken immediately to strengthen the ether body so that it will inhibit the damaging effect of the astral body. We used silver injections in high potency and this resulted in the temperature being reduced. The patient had gained 10 kilograms in weight when she left the clinic and was much stronger. We are perfectly aware that in this case follow-up treatment will be needed to reinforce the cure. Close quote. Steiner again. The case is meant to show how one can really find a way of making practical use in treatment of aspects otherwise considered in a more theoretical way concerning astral body and ether body. We may now come up against the question always put by well-meaning people. Should we use the terms we have been using here, making them the naked truth and reality, or should we paraphrase? Well-meaning people have said that we should not say ether body, but functional processes or something like that. In that case, we cannot get as far as the astral body. Now the situation is that we do not get to the essence of most diseases unless we go up as far as the astral body. The damage caused by the eye organization, that is, the serious damage due to metabolic deposits, here the situation is that it is evidently there, this damage. The destructive damage due to the astral body is more insidious 
and it is simply the case that we must speak of the astral body. Well, the case will be that we can simply say, yes, many people will say this, that one should not talk straight away about astral body and ether body. But if you do not talk about them, there will simply be no reason for anyone to think that this is something new. People think that one thing or another has just been changed a little. The approach is the same as everywhere else. At best, it is just a tiny step forward. But that is not the case. And this must be made radically clear to people. If we show that these are not abstract things, but point out the nature of the individual case in these many wholly concrete individual cases, and then show how diagnosis leads to treatment, and how healing comes as soon as the treatment is applied, the point is that this must be understood. Otherwise we would have to despair altogether when it comes to human ability to understand. I am fully convinced that this is the only way for us. Say things boldly, with courage. There's a comment. A question is asked as to how the scientific picture appears if a close study is made of carcinoma. Steiner again. With cancer it is altogether a matter of a sense organ being called into existence at a point in the organization where there is no reason for this. Take the most radical sensory organization, as I'd call it, take the eye, E-Y-E. What makes the eye develop? You know that it is really half created from outside. It is integrated into the organism. The organism, on its part, leaves room for the eye socket, to put it crudely. The eye is then placed in this, see plate 9. This indicates that processes from outside the human being are mainly involved in creating the eye. The eye is merely embraced by the human being. With a sense organ as striking as the eye, we are able to say, a foreign body is integrated into the human organism. This is putting it in radical terms, in a truly unfamiliar way. Something like the lens or vitreous body, or the material composition in lens and vitreous body, could never arise from the human organism. And everything placed there, being partly still etheric, and not merely physical deposits, in the case of the eye, is enveloped by the astral body and eye organization, which are really, as far as possible, emancipated from the physical and etheric in the case of the eye. The relationship between capital I, astral body, ether body, and physical body is very different in the I, E, Y, E than it is, say, in a piece of muscle. In a piece of calf muscle, you see I, capital, astral body, ether body, and physical body brought very close together. If I were to put this in the style of a chemical formula, it is that in the I, E, Y, E, plate 9, I, capital, and astral body, uh, parenthesis, capital I and A in the drawing, close parenthesis, are closely bound up with each other, and the other two are also intensely bound up with one another. The affinity between ether body and astral body is a loose one. This situation pertains only to the I, E-Y-E. It is not the same for other sense organs, such as the ear, for example. There it cannot be said to be like this. There the affinity between eye organization and astral body, and also between physical body and ether body, is a loose one. It is slightly different for each of the senses. If the tendency to develop a sensory organization arises somewhere in the human organism, where there should not be any sensory organization, the tendency may develop in every part of the human organism. Something due to happen elsewhere may come up as a t tendency in any other place. We can see how physical body and ether body on the one hand and astral body and capital I on the other fall apart. Take a concrete case. If there is a strong physical impact on, let us say, the mammary gland, the impact continues on inside, showing the evolution of an effect within the skin, roughly speaking, which had its origin outside. A mechanical insult, therefore, continuing on inside. This will in most cases be the true origin of breast cancer. 
otherwise it could only be a protracted overheating or combustion process. It will always, speaking in external terms as I put it here, be an insult which brings it about. What happens in such a case is that the astral body comes up very strongly in the sight, where it is normally absorbed by the ether body. When the astral body comes up suddenly in the sight, it appears in gleaming form. It looks as if it was a fire. If it shows itself like this, we have a tendency to develop sensory effects in the sight. A carcinoma develops. It is beyond question that we may at least start with the first seven inoculations. The situation there gets particularly interesting if we see how one thing relates to another. Imagine you have someone who is no longer all that young. You need to remove the carcinoma. But the principle you have with a fairly well-developed carcinoma is a tendency to let processes from outside the human being take place really in the whole body, for the organism is a whole. The carcinoma changes in a quite peculiar way as it progresses. After a time, the local carcinoma becomes a valve for concentrating carcin carcinomatous development. Carcinomatous development. If you cut it out, the valve will suddenly be gone. But if you are dealing with an older person, you get this ability now to have valves for that existing tendency to have outside principles in the human being in the organ which takes in the inorganic outside world most in the human being, which is the lung. With a carcinoma existing in an older person, you will therefore dissolve the process into pneumonia. If the organism is sclerotic, the process concludes with pneumonia in old age. The reason is that an old organism takes in more of the outside world, doing so more easily than a younger organism does. The lung is the organ which takes in external processes most easily and suffers damage in the process. The liver is an organ which easily takes up external processes without suffering damage. It is quite thick-skinned when it comes to external processes. The lung takes them and is damaged by them. Excuse me, the lung takes them in and is damaged by them. This is the crux of the matter, that the lung takes them in easily and suffers damage. Comment. Question about heredity relating to the tendency to develop cancer. Rudolf Steiner again. That is connected with ideas people pick up. Essentially, people are not inclined to fear cancer. This is evident from the fact that the fear exists more among educated people in more highly civilized countries. Country people do not have that fear. They have cancer, die of it, never knew anything about carcinoma. It is something that comes with education and must be combated. Comment. How far is supersensible vision necessary in these two cases, and how is it applied? Rudolf Steiner again. The procedure must be like this. Initially, in order to make any kind of start, you have to master spiritual vision fully, something which comes in the course of time. See how something you are able to establish in spiritual science relates to symptoms evident to the outside if nothing else is given, the purely spiritual scientific findings are always evident. Comment. How is it perceived from outside? Steiner again. Well, one may just as well say again that it should, of course, be meditative. You can meditate on rheum arthritis. You can meditate on diabetes. This will, however, drive you back again. A good way of arriving at spiritual scientific observation is to meditate on a disease process in its symptoms. Only it is not easy to go in the opposite direction. You may even do what homeopaths do, collect all the symptoms and base the treatment on this. Only in that case it happens again and again. I am not even saying may happen, for I know that this is how it is, that symptoms are overestimated or underestimated, brought together in the wrong way so that sometimes a combination of symptoms made by homeopaths actually is a caricature of the real thing. If you meditate on this, you meditate your way into the caricatures. 
if you have a genuine spiritual scientific cause, if this determines the set of symptoms, you will not overestimate or underestimate any of the symptoms. You will have noticed that we gave the symptoms first. These are no caricatures but well-developed sets of symptoms. If you meditate, you find it impossible to establish spiritual scientific findings. And if someone says this cannot be done, I have to say, try it, not with a set of symptoms, but together, arbitrarily, but with spiritual, scientifically established set of symptoms. Comment. What is the basis of your rhythm? In the human organism, Steiner again, in the human organism, everything is based on the fact that things which are conscious are derived from things that are unconscious. The basis of eurythmy is that when someone is born and wants to come into his own, he does not lack the words for this, but he lacks the ability to be fully himself in using the movements of his limbs. This element is beaten back. He must not do it and cannot do it. People do not notice it today, this beaten back element, because it is beaten back through heredity itself. All this becomes integrated, metamorphoses, Metamorphoses emerges bound to the air and makes itself at home in speech. Let me read that sentence again. All this becomes integrated. Metamorphoses emerges bound to the air and makes itself at home in speech. If we know how this has entered into speech, if we know that this is the origin of speech, we are able to go back from speech to the movements, conscious of this the other way around. And there, too, it is the case that spiritual scientific diagnosis casts light on the set of symptoms. If you develop it and meditate on it, you will in turn arrive at spiritual scientific diagnosis. I have to leave it at these three sessions. I hope we will meet again. But if you come more often, this small social element will develop into the key for future activity. It has certainly been good that we have once more been able to talk about things. That is the end of this last, let's call it Lecture 17, this last, the second discussion, is the end of the book Physiology and Healing, Treatment, Therapy and Hygiene, 13 lectures, an address, two discussions, and a question and answer session held in Dornach and Stuttgart between March 1920 and April 1924, English by Anna R. Moise. Collected Works, Volume 314.